Welcome to our lecture on St. Thomas Aquinas. This is one of the most preeminent minds of all history, and he stands at the very culmination of the medieval period. This is the highest point of the high Middle Ages. Um, the 13th century is a time of great drama uh, when the crusading fever had reached a, uh, its, its highest pitch and uh, when the Mongols were destroying the, the Abbasid uh, Caliphate and that, that world that had thrived for so long. In this time of great turmoil and great dynamism, Aquinas is presenting a vision of human reason as capable of um, grasping reality and of being docile to a divine inspiration that would allow a view of the whole that is uh, comprehensive. So this is the confidence of human intellect at a time when uh, civilization is, is really uh, gaining ground, is, is finally taken hold again in Western Europe. St. Thomas was born in Rocca Secca, which is uh, between Rome and Naples, near Monte Cassino, the, the great monastic foundation of uh, St. Benedict. He was born around 1225, maybe 1224, and he died in 1274, not, not even 50 years old, which is quite remarkable. His family was of the uh, minor nobility and uh, related to the Counts of Aquino, so hence Aquinas. Uh, he was the youngest son, so he was meant to be something like, as they were oblates often, they given over to the monasteries to become, to advance themselves there. Presumably the family would have wanted him to become abbot of Monte Cassino. But uh, he had his, God had his own plan. So at first he got his studies at uh, the Benedictine monastery, and so he got that contemplative habit there. Eventually, he would go on to, to start his university studies in 1239. Again, a young teenager, uh, that, that was the uh, habit of the time. At the new university in Naples, which was founded by Emperor Frederick II, who would be the target of papal crusading. So uh, he was this remarkable figure between the Islamic and the Christian worlds, he was a threat to the papacy, or the papacy thought of him as a threat because he ruled the Holy Roman Empire from the south of Italy, and the Holy Roman Emperor would therefore have territories surrounding the papal states. So given the great power politics of the time, um, the popes were committed to um, forcing the Holy Roman Emperors out of the south and into the north. Uh, this was ruinous for both the German ruler, the Holy Roman Emperor, and, and for the papacy eventually. Uh, but at this time, the emperor, was a, who was a great man of, of, of learning, he was insatiably uh, curious. He started this, this uh, university in Naples, and that's where uh, Aquinas began his first university studies. He would uh, become a Dominican in 1244, after various shenanigans on the part of his family to, to keep him from taking that step. Um, he went on, he was sent by the order to Paris and from 1245 to 1259, except for this uh, four year period, he was in Paris um, studying and in the, as Jean-Pierre Torel calls it, the, in, the intellectual capital of Christendom. Uh, that cathedral school of Notre Dame had, had blossomed into the University of Paris. And he was also at this uh, Dominican institution, the Convent of Saint-Jacques, which um, would later become the, the site of the Jacobins, which is uh, one of those historical ironies. But at this time, it was a great research center. Um, and so there was both ferment in the Dominican house itself, as well as in the university. And Thomas was just eating all of this up. He studied under Albert the Great, and so this is one of the great influences on uh, Aquinas' mind and heart. 
uh, and it would be with Albert that he would leave for Cologne um, for this, this four year period from 1248 to 1252. And uh, he would finish his Bachelor of Scripture there under Albert and then come back um, to Paris and finish his Bachelor of the Sentences. Remember, we have talked about the um, the sen sentences of Peter Lombard as being the basic uh, theological training tool. Uh, that Bishop of Paris had compiled all of these sayings from the, the, the sententiae, uh, these, these propositions from the fathers of the church, and tried to um, give a systematic approach to the whole of theology. Having become a bachelor of both scripture and the sentences, he, he was, um, and a further step, he was uh, designated a magister in sacra pagina, which is a magister means teacher, a master is teacher of the sacred page in 1256, that is, of scripture. He was a theologian meant above all that you are capable of communicating the riches of the Bible. That's what it meant. And as a master, he would read out scripture. Lectures means to originally to read out. This is still the kind of the monastic habit to read the uh, sacred page line by line and to comment as necessary. That's legere. The second task that a master had to carry out was disputare, which is to deal with questions that are uh, publicly debated and to have a dialogue with objectors and so on. And that, that will have its um, echo, obviously, in the Summa Theologiae. And then predicare, according to the statutes of the University of Paris, one of the things you had to do as a master was to preach, that is, communicate the riches that you've gained from hard study um, to the people. So he, after this long period in Paris and plus Cologne, uh, Cologne, he went to Ordovieto, he was sent by the order to Ordovieto from 1261 to 1265. There he was in charge of forming young Dominicans. Um, most Dominicans weren't able to um, get university studies, even though the order was had placed a premium on intellectual formation. So Thomas was charged with what we would call, I don't know, extension education courses, right? Ways of trying to uh, cultivate these young Dominicans who wouldn't be able to go to university for their formation. And so it was here that he uh, realized the need for something like the Summa Theologiae, that is, to take all the moral manuals and, and um, other forms of theological instruction and put them into an organic, systematic context. So he begins work on that. He sent um, in 1265 to form a new house of studies in Rome. That would be completely his, his, um, of his shaping. He there begins a series of Aristotle commentaries, which is, it, it, it's very important work, and it, it's there as subsidiary to his, it's kind of research that, that helps him carry out the project of the cinema. And then from 1268 to 1272, he's back in Paris. Okay, so there he's a, He's a professor alongside Bonaventure, um, and they're dealing with attacks on the Dominican orders that by the secular uh, masters who do not think the Dominicans and the Franciscans, the, the begging orders, should have um, the prominent role that they have in the University of Paris. Uh, so they're Bonaventure and, and Thomas are, are brothers in arms in this in this polemical controversy. Um, already, even in his sentences commentary, uh, Aquinas was making use of Bonaventure along with Albert as his contemporaries in his work. So, um, and it says something about the quality of Bonaventure's mind, even though they weren't exactly on the same page. And the other thing that, that Aquinas was trying to deal with in Paris at this late, in this later state was, on the one hand, the, the party that was kind of aligned with Bonaventure, the we can call the Augustinians, who were very leery of all this Aristotle that was coming in, 
all of this um, natural reason as if what mattered isn't what God reveals through the Bible, but all of this scientific inquiry and all of this logical um, reasoning. So Aquinas wanted to vindicate the claims of natural reason in the life of the university. On the other hand, against these, these what, uh, radical or uh, radical Augustinians. On the other hand, he was dealing with radical Averroists, that is, radical Aristotelians who wanted to upend the ordering of theology and philosophy by saying that reason has the final word, as it, as it were. And if there are propositions of the faith that, such as the creation of the world, as opposed to the eternity of the world, as we find in Aristotle, or in Averroes, he claims that there is one agent intellect, monopsychism. Um, the Averroes are going to say, well, I mean, what are we to do? This is what natural reason delivers. Aquinas comes in and he is having to resist that side too because he wants to say natural reason in fact does have its own autonomy but it's still within the context of a theological uh, order. So he goes from Paris in 72 to Naples back to his home territory back, in fact, to form a house of studies that would serve as the theology faculty for that University of Naples. Uh, at the end of 73, it seems a, about the time of the Feast of St. Nicholas, he, he just stops writing. And there's that famous quote about, I, I can't write because all, compared to what I've seen, everything I've written seems like a straw. Uh, the next year, he's on his way to the Council of Lyon or to help prepare for it, and he hits his head on a tree as he's riding, and uh, a few days later he dies from, from that. So, in Paris, it should be noted here, he, he writes feverishly to, um, to finish the Summa Theologiae, and he writes the massive second part, the Secunda Pars, within 18 months, which is really quite remarkable. That's what we'll get to after framing, so that's, that's biography. What we want to be moved by with uh, Aquinas is this arrows of thought, which we've seen in other thinkers, especially Abelard, but how do we come to terms with reality, right? There, there are some of us who are believers in some kind of religious tradition. So for us, revelation has an essential role to play in our locating ourselves within the big picture and in fact trying to get a sense of the big picture. So that's one subsidiary question. Do we think there's a big picture to get? If there is a big picture, how do you get it? If there's revelation, that would obviously be important to try to understand this. How does reason fit in? If there is no revelation, if there is revelation, how does one's intellectual work fit in? How much am I obligated to work out the shape of reality? How much do I feel obligated to do so? With Thomas Aquinas, we find a person who is on fire for reality, for the truth, who just wants to read everything and to grapple with everything to get a picture of the whole. He is he's in love with reality. In this fervor, he identifies the natural light of reason, lumen naturale, uh, as something distinct from the lumen gratia, the light of grace, and then further you've got the light of glory. But what makes us different from the Augustinian tradition that he's still very much a part of? I mean, one can say that the Augustinians there are on his right, as it were, but he's still an Augustinian in some basic sense. But this is different. 
And this is a place where he's, he's making a change. Augustine talks about, he has this illuminationist view that every time we, we get an insight, it's the light of God in us. And Aquinas doesn't exactly dispute that, but he wants to make a distinction. It's a major distinction. He wants to say that that, that natural insight, when we come to understand, for instance, that um, the cause of the sun rising and setting is, well, as it turns out, the orbiting of the earth around the sun and the, the tilt of the axis and so and the rotation on the axis. Well, for Aquinas, that is God, but not in the sense that God is kind of directly zapping our minds, but in, in the sense that God is illuminating reality. On top of that would be the light of grace, where if we were to come to know something like the nature of God is Trinity, God would actually have to make a specific, um, would have to light things up in a, in a specific way. So he's distinguishing between what we would call nature and grace. Giving to nature, an recognizing in nature an intelligibility that would be accessible to every single human intelligence. That is, you don't have to be Christian seems so simple, but it was Aquinas who actually secured this result for Christianity. You don't have to be Christian to understand important truths about reality, about the natural world. There are important things, things worth knowing that you don't need to have faith to uh, understand. But there are, and this is where he's resisting the Averroes, there are profound truths, the most important truths, which you actually do need the light of grace, or you can't get to them. So he's, he's maintaining that balance. And he's confident that there is a unitary truth. He's absolutely confident that whatever science delivers, say he would not be afraid that about Darwin's findings, for instance, because he's convinced that there's one reality, there's one truth, and the truth that's delivered by the light of reason is not going to be contradictory to the truths delivered by the light of faith. Um, Oh, actually, that's right. The, the more common word here is the lumen fide, the light of faith, instead of the light of grace. So that light of faith is going to give us insight into the thing which we, we've, we've alluded to in the past. That medieval problematic, the one that's most characteristic, is how to reconcile reason and revelation. We've seen that in terms of the, the great traditions, the great monotheistic traditions of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity coming into contact with the emergence, the eruption of classical philosophy. Okay, here it is. This is, this is the great moment of equilibrium in this medieval uh, pursuit. All right. Well, what we have is Aquinas saying there is something about God which we can know by reason. He exists, he's one. The preambles of the faith, he calls them. But then there are mysteries of faith that are only accessible by the light of faith, the lumen fidei. Okay, well, what, what is that? Well, that's the Trinity. And that's that residue, as it were, that would bring to grief any simply rationalistic project. And we'll see this played out in modernity insofar as those that want a more rationalistic religion will, will revert, if, in source they keep being religious, they'll revert to Unitarianism. The Trinity is going to be that hard-edged thing. We've seen a kind of, a, you can see a kind of isomorphic thing with Al-Ghazali when he talks about mystical knowledge being something, uh, a whole level above rational knowledge. Well, the Trinity is something there that, that, that literally has to be a whole world above what's accessible to natural reason. Now, it, it's kind of neat and clear in Aquinas, and one might want to say from where we are, and Aquinas might, if he were with us now, uh, in time. Well, is it the case that the Trinity maybe bleeds through the world that is accessible to every human being? And that's, that's tended to be the way um, the current Catholic theology has, has gone. 
In any case, what Aquinas has is the sense that our, uh, our intellect is, which is, has to operate through ratio, through reason, but our intellect is correlative to ipsum intelligere, that is, God under this definition as being understanding itself. God is being itself, ipsum esse, subsistence. God is love itself, ipsum amare, and God is understanding itself, ipsum intelligere. And he is absolutely convinced that our intelligence which is served by our reason is is something that is correlative to this reality so what we have in the summa theologiae the summa of theology and the summa was a genre typical of the high medieval age um, there were three forms of it one would be an encyclopedia compila compilation of, of knowledge one would be a precious summary of knowledge and then in between you have what he's, uh, Aquinas is doing in the Summa of Theology. That is um, something that's between exhaustive encyclopedia and a praise, something that is a systematization that presents knowledge organically. And the, the presentation here is in terms of all things coming from God and going back to God. Exodus, leaving God and ready to, going back to God. And that's the structure of the Summa itself. In the first part, the prima pars, you have the treatment of God as de Deo Uno, on, uh, the one God, de Deo Trino, the, the trying, trying God, and then creation coming from that God. You have in the second part, this massive ethical consideration in which creation returns through free action. So it's human action returning to God through, through virtuous behavior. But that's not the end of the returns. You have to go to the tertia parts, which was not complete. Um, and that we find out, in fact, the way that the free agent is actually traversing to get back to God is Christ. So you have the Christology in the third part, and he would have gone on to get do the sacraments as the other means, or the means within Christ, by which this path is trod. And you have the eschatology, the, the last things. All of this is part of sacra doctrina, that is sacred teaching, doctrine, doctor, docere means to teach. Sacra do doctrina, here he's humbling theologians because, in fact, our science, as it were, is something subalternated to the science of the blessed in heaven and above all, to the fact that God teaches in Revelation. So there's, there's meant to be this fact that the theologian doesn't get to lord it over all the other faculties. There ought to be a fundamental submission to the um, revelation of God. And what would be the point of revelation if that humility weren't something that is always um, treasured and, and desired? So this is the, the great pattern of this, this monumental work. And you have just a couple of notes here. In the Prima Pars, question 43, you, you have the sense of the Trinity invading history because the, the very inner life of God, the processions of the Word and the Spirit, they, they end up enfolding history. The external, the, the, the ultimate term the external term of the um, procession of the word is the incarnation. The external term of the, of the invisible mission of the spirit is the sanctified, uh, sanctifying grace in the soul of the believer. This is the way that the Trinity enfolds history. And then two questions later in the Prima Pars, question 45, we have a reminder that the emanation of creatures from God is according to the type of the procession of the persons. So that's that's what I meant to say, that there's a way in which Aquinas is making very clear that natural reason is correlated to the one God. The light of faith is all is necessary in order to see the, the Trinity. But the Trinity is always right, right there. It has to be. I mean, if this is the reality, the, the Trinity is the, the structure of history of, creation, 
the cosmos. And so maybe, maybe Aquinas wouldn't be too shocked at the turn that dogmatic theology, Catholic dogmatic theology has taken in, in trying to make the Trinity more um, the first uh, apology, as it were, for Christianity, this, this notion that God is love. But in any case, uh, we want to take Aquinas to heart and try to, to realize in ourselves, regardless of what, whether we're believers or not, this urgency to, 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 to get a sense of what the big picture is, to know that there's a story that I'm a part of, and to realize that everything that I know, come to know in this world, is, is a way for me to try to live more lovingly, live more intelligently, live more for the sake of the common good. These are all essential aspects of uh, the Thomistic vision. That's why he's the common doctor and the angelic doctor, because he's, he's talking about things that, that, that order this world sweetly, the wisdom that is the very music of reality. And we can take that to heart, no matter where we're coming from, in terms of initial, ultimate commitments. This is something that we can all feel in ourselves, that there is a song that's being sung that catches us all up, and we want to be part of that. And how can we do it intelligently and lovingly? And reading the Summa Theologiae is really an indispensable means of accomplishing that.